I wasn't expecting that. OK, all right. So um, I'm going to be talking about text complexity and task complexity. And I, I want to acknowledge um, my, my wonderful friend, uh, David Pearson, and also Karen Wixon and Sheila Valencia. You'll see I'll be focusing a lot on task complexity. And um, part of that focus is a result of um, reading some works that they've done and, and being part of uh, an AERA symposium last year. So I want to thank them in advance for this. So um, this is what I'll, I'll be trying to cover in a half an hour. And by the way, I'm double booked. I have to, what, as, as soon as I'm done, I have to run upstairs. You'll probably be really happy to hear that, right? So, um, but I won't be around uh, to ask questions. But if you want to email, there's an email address at the end of the presentation. I, I just want to talk about um, situating assessment in the Common Core, then a little overview of models of reading and reading assessment. Uh, then I'm going to focus on a particular Common Core standard um, and, and look at the complexity of the tasks that are related to this uh, standard, and then talk about why I think formative assessment has to be front and center if we're um, to be anywhere near successful in helping kids meet or exceed the Common Core state standards. Right. So I, I think about assessment as, a, as a, like a whole bunch of social things that we do um, with a lot of different economic, political, social forces acting. So I just want to share where, I, uh, where I'm coming from. I think David mentioned this this morning, like a curriculum and assessment dance and who's leading. And, and all of us in this room would probably say that too often assessment has led. And it's probably a better idea to think about assessment and curriculum development simultaneously. They can both inform each other in good ways. Um, you may have heard this. I know that over the last two years, every school that I've visited uh, has been marked by anxiety, uh, maybe a little bit of frustration with the idea that uh, the formative assessments that I'm so um, behind have to match up with the things that are being created by Park and that other consortium. It sounds like a high fiber cereal, uh, smarter balance, right? Okay, so. Um, and what I've heard is, well, it's like we're building a plane while we're flying. I, well, I don't want to be on that plane, but apparently we all have to be on that plane. Um, uh, I think there's, we're still, still dealing not only with the, um, the stuff of No Child Left Behind, and I think what was, um, sometimes too much of a hyper focus on mechanics and not enough on things like comprehension. But not just the, the content of curriculum and the content of initiatives, but the nature of the initiatives. And whereas I think No Child Left Behind was quite, quite prescriptive, now we have a, another giant initiative which is, is, is prescriptive, but it's sort of hands-off prescriptive. Like, here's what you got to hit, and you figure out how you get there. And, it, I think it's um, unusual to ask groups of teachers, districts, and states to just stop going in one direction, do an about face, and come around. Uh, I think it's really important that we continue to think about unskewing the frequency and weight of summative testing. Um, and I, I really like formative assessment um, because I think it offers a lot of promise um, to, to help kids in a lot of ways, to help teachers in a lot of ways. And I also am going to just touch upon the fact that if we um, continue to focus only on cognitive development, um, any, anyone out in the audience who's a classroom teacher or has been a classroom teacher knows that without motivation and engagement, it really doesn't matter. Um, if students are not with you, then they, will, um, they won't be with you. And then finally, um, the, the group I worry most about with the Common Core, um, having worked with NAEP for about 15 years, is the, the kids who are at the bottom of the achievement gap. And, and if you think about how many millions of kids fail to meet even a basic level of reading, according to the NAEP, um, the, what the Common Core offers to me is a raising of the bar. Um, and so how those kids will ever get there seems to be something that we really need to focus on. Right. So um, th these are things, my daughter's needlepoint, these are over our fireplace at, in the house. Um, how well we know assessment should be reflected in how well we assess, and how well we know reading should be apparent in how well we assess reading. I'm not sure that that's been the case. David gave us a little bit of history this morning about why it might not be the case. Um, an example here would be um, my daughter came home, one of my daughters, with the top item as an example of our brand new, wonderful Maryland State Assessment in Reading back in 2006. She was in fourth grade. And uh, that, uh, that didn't seem to me to be, most of the items in this brochure were like this. It's not that I'm picking out one to pick on, but um, 
If you look at 1966, when I was in fourth grade in PS 33 in Queens, New York, um, you don't see much difference there. And, and formative assessment and the performance assessments that SBAC and Park are developing, I really, really like a quantum leap forward, which, which I think is a good thing if we're up to the task of helping kids prepare to do those tasks. Right, and then models of reading and reading assessment. So back in 2009, you know, NAEP about every 10 or 12 years uh, gets groups of people together and asks them to sit down and come up with a definition of reading. And the definition of reading that was come up with in 2009, I think had a, uh, a really, really radical change in the idea what, about what reading is. And it's the, the bullet that's highlighted there. And, and the idea that reading is not just about the construction of meaning, but that reading is about constructing meaning and then applying the meaning that you've constructed, that, that's, that's a watershed event, I think, both from uh, models of reading and then implications for reading assessment perspective. Right? And I think the Common Core really, really nails that. I mean, the Common Core is about understanding what you read, but it's also about applying what you've learned in complete, increasingly complex tasks and texts. Right. Um, I don't mean to imply a hierarchy here, but I think that these are really important alignments that should be uh, existing in our schooling systems. And the, uh, the idea is that the construct of reading, what, what is the amassed understanding of what reading is? What, is? what are all the research results? What are experienced teachers and their insights into what reading is? How are they um, telling us what we should focus on when we do something like create the Common Core Standards. And if you read the Common Core Standards, you might say, I would, that not all of what we know about reading got paid attention to, right? unfortunately. Um, but nevertheless, the Common Core Standards do derive from some aspects of what we know about the construct of reading. And then, um, well, I guess, given the systems that we work in, it's really important that the curriculum and instruction related to reading maps back up to the Common Core State Standards. Otherwise, there's going to be all sorts of problems when the last part of this alignment comes into play, which is reading assessment. Or if, if your curriculum and instructions misaligned with the Common Core, but the assessments aligned with the Common Core, um, you may end up looking not so good in, in any type of assessment that's done. Another way of looking at, at this is that if you draw a line straight from reading assessment to the construct of reading, that's part of how we would explain construct validity in an assessment. Right. And then uh, a wonderful book that came out in 2001, it's called Knowing What Students Know by Pellegrini, Trudowski, and Glazer. Um, I, I love this little model that they came up with. It's sort of very parsimonious and I think has high explanatory value. If you look at the top of the triangle, um, th what these authors claim is that if we, we are really good at defining and describing in detail the thing that we want to assess, that's the, the most important first step in developing a good assessment. And after we've done that, and, and we've consulted all uh, legitimate knowledge to make that determination. Then we go down to the left-hand corner, and that's where we start building our assessments of the thing or the construct that we're interested in measuring. And that dialogue between the construct and assessment is, I think, part of what's um, going on with Park and SBAC right now. It's a, what, what are these things that the Common Core wants students to be able to do? And how would we possibly measure these things? And I think that helps explain why for the last 12 months when people have gone to these websites, there hasn't been that much new product on the websites of Park and SBAC. But a promise of product, product soon. Right? And then if we go from the bottom left to the bottom right corner, th this, is, um, this is assessment 101. You know that we assess um, so that we can make inferences about students based on samples of their behavior. And, and so if we get to the bottom right and we've done a really good job on the bottom left and a really good job on the top angle of this triangle, then we can probably have high confidence in the inferences that we make about students. And that would be inferences about what does the student need next in terms of my instruction? Does the student need to repeat a lesson? Do we need to move the student for some special consideration instructionally? Things like that. Now if you look at uh, the task up there, it's what does it mean to summarize a challenging history text? And in the Common Core, um, just in terms of complexity, you might see a change to something like this. What's it mean to summarize a challenging history text? Then critically comp compare three text summaries for information, accuracy, and trustworthiness. Right, so that, 
that complexifies the construct and complexifies the assessments that we have to build related to it. And you probably all read this, um, just some of the uh, blurb from the front matter of the Common Core, and it's, um, it's pretty impressive when you read it in terms of what the Common Core creators hope students will be able to do as a result of hitting the Common Core. But to do that takes a lot of good learning, it takes a lot of very talented teaching, and it takes a lot of uh, world-class assessment. And the scientific way to say that would be for students to do all that stuff and do that stuff well, there has to be lots of top-notch assessment, formative assessment. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do now is um, I, I, I've lifted a Common Core State Standard for reading informational text. And I'm going to give you a text and a picture because that's part of what the standard focuses on. And I've really, really toned down um, the, the text complexity so that we can focus on task complexity. So here, here's... Uh, Here's the standard, right? Explain how specific images, a diagram showing how a machine works, for example, contribute to and clarify a text. So that's one of the standards under the category of informational text, integration of knowledge and ideas. All right, so here's, um, here's the text. You might be able to tell that I wrote that text. Um, and for those of you who like bridges, that's the Tyne River in Newcastle, UK. And if you drink Newcastle Brown Ale, you can see one of those bridges on the label of, of the beer. Okay. <laughs> just in case you're, you're wondering, right? So I would say that that's a very simple text. On a text complexity staircase, it would be like maybe sub-basement. I'm not sure. It would be low, right? Um, and, but, but if you step back and, and do a task analysis of what a student trying to meet that standard has to do, and you know, task analyses are these invaluable things where you just try to imagine what it's like for a student to walk through an assessment and come out okay. Um, this is what happens. To demonstrate achievement in a, in a performance assessment related to that standard, um, the student would have to construct meaning from the text, um, would have to comprehend a related image. Um, the student would have to compare the two related understandings, analyze the two for their separate and joint contributions to understanding, explain through writing or speaking how the two comprehended parts relate to one another, describe how the image helps comprehension, and I'm just guessing, be really, really metacognitive to be able to coordinate all of those things. Right? A little bit later, I'll focus on metacognition because I think that's something that's very under um, appreciated and not so often taught for students. Okay, so um, again, I, I really dumbed down the text so we could focus on task complexity here. That's a second grade standard, right? And, and I think that that's, um, that's part of our challenge, right? So, so if, if those are the things that a student must do to hit a second grade standard, then, then I think we get in a better position to think about the types of assessment that have to happen, first of all, to see if a student gets to those performances, but also um, what kind of formative assessment we would have to be doing to help move the student too. Because th as, as David said this morning, it's, it's really about orchestrating separate things into a grand performance. And those six or seven strands or demands on a kid have to, have to be orchestrated so that the kid can pull off the, the item in a way that says you, you're successful at this common core standard. And so here, here's where I think we really get um, to the, the value of formative assessment, right? So each of those facets has to be a necessary focus of a formative assessment. How would a child uh, learn to reason uh, with information from a picture and information from a text? without us teaching them, and then how would we know how well they're learning unless we're doing assessment along the way? Right. So, I, and I think that's an important question. Could you imagine a kid who doesn't really, imagine maybe one of those kids who right now doesn't hit basic in NAEP fourth grade reading. Um, could you imagine that child taking on that task and succeeding without massive expert formative assessment? So now I want to move from that common core example to what I, what I think is promising about formative assessment, but also what's pretty daunting about it, all right? So um, here's, here's some, I think, generally held beliefs and um, understandings about formative assessment. It's usually uh, considered to be a fluid, dynamic, ongoing process, um, and the teacher positions herself or himself to get fresh information as often as possible. And if, if you're a, a fan of Kinch or uh, any like construction of meaning models, I think the idea of building a mental model of text um, transplants pretty well to, to building a mental model of our students. And we have to continually update that model so that we can best adjust our instruction, best, best uh, refine our understanding of the student. Okay. 
Right. And it's conducted in the midst of teaching and learning, uh, and the information enables teachers to continually update stu student understanding. It directly informs teaching and learning. It should con contribute to students' reading growth. And it's prominent in successful schools, uh, classrooms, and districts. Right. So you might, I'm not a math person, so this is the extent of my math ability. <laughs> but um, what I'm trying to present here is that we, I, I think the summative assessments are you know, they continue to just be so powerful and so um, resource demanding. And, and so what we need to do is think about the summative assessments are going to stay as powerful as they have been, but I think they're going to get better. I, and I think we should all be happy about that. But we also th have to think about uh, what kind of path of formative assessment points at, or leads in the exact direction of the summative assessment. And if we take care of these formative assessments along the way, it's, it's in, in one sense, it's teaching to the test. But, but the assessment or test is a much better thing to teach to than what we've been used to teaching to, right? And, and, and also, I'd want this slide to help hopefully represent the planning that has to be done from a, an assessment and curriculum perspective. So that it's not scattershot, but it's a very, um, it's a very thoughtful um, and well-paced movement towards a uh, summative assessment. And I, I, this is the other thing that's needle pointed over the fireplace. I, and I really believe this, that if we start believing that accountability is created by doing formative assessment and teaching well all the time, um, and then make sure that people understand that accountability is measured or accountability is judged by a high stakes test, but it's created by good teaching and good assessment on a daily basis. All right, and now um, I want to share. I have. This is one of my two favorite um, soccer players in the world here. And this is a non-common core um, example. All right, so this is my older daughter who, she's played soccer forever, I think. And this picture is not brand new. She uh, was the captain of her soccer team in high school for three years, and she was on a travel team. And on her travel team, she worked with a guy named Malcolm, who is the best coach I've ever had the uh, honor of watching coach. And Malcolm is about 70. He grew up in the UK and no soccer inside and out. And I would stand at practices on the, on the sideline. I'd try to figure out what he was doing to figure out how each of the 18 young ladies on his team were progressing or if they weren't. And then, and then how he adjusted his, his training, his one-on-ones or small group or whole group um, practices to, to the needs of each of the uh, students or athletes. And he, when I asked him, he, he reeled off this list on the left-hand side of the slide. He, he didn't have it written down. He just, he had it memorized, right? And um, I think that part of what has to happen for us to be really good at formative assessment in the classroom is that we have to get these very well-developed schema about the things that we're looking for, how they fit with our teaching, and how they exist or don't exist within each of the students in our classroom. That is, that is a gargantuan task. But it, it's the one that we must re really try our best at if we get all of our students towards the common core. So he's, he's looking at each of these uh, students or athletes as they're running up and down the field. And if you're a fan of football or soccer, then you know, like any, any sport where resilience and creativity are, are things that you look for, you know that's why it's called the beautiful game, right? He said, if I take care of the stuff, stuff on the left-hand side, the stuff on the right-hand side takes care of itself. And, and that's, I, I believe that about formative assessment and its relation to summative assessment, that when you are good on a daily basis, your students cannot help but do well in the assessment that they get at the end of the year. Right. So if we um, transfer that to, oh, and so I don't know what the implications are about Malcolm. He's 70, so I, I don't think I would want to suggest that all teachers have to be 70, but, but I think that it's that over the years, could you imagine a professional development? Well, you're like 46, so could you sit in a room for 24 years and then we'll come and get you and then you'll be really good at formative assessment. But it's, um, it's, about, it's about that instantly accessible expert knowledge about what it means in, to be a soccer player, what it means to be a developing reader, and, and then being able to connect that to the instruction that we're in the midst of and the curriculum that we're in the, in the midst of. It's, it's quite a, a set of tasks, right? So you know, we, we can transform that to think about what, what might this look for a teacher in a, an elementary school classroom, for example, in, in the era of the Common Core. And I, I think that it's really important that 
we remember the last 10 or 15 years and the things that worked in our classrooms. If we ended up paying more attention to phonics than we had as a result of No Child Left Behind, and we found an assessment that we're comfortable with, that we believe gives us useful information, then I think we should stick with those things. But the Common Core says, you remember, that's really the beginning of our assessment challenge. The things towards the bottom left column or higher order thinking content area learning and the, com the doing of complex tasks are the things that we'll also have to be assessing. And my understanding would be, based on Malcolm's model, that the things on the right hand side would work because we've been paying attention to the things on the right hand, on the left hand side. Right. And now another way of thinking about this, go back to those seven things that a kid had to do to read the bridge text and then do the picture and text comparison, is I've put in quotation marks there, describe how the image helps comprehension. And uh, along the bottom, I'm thinking about a student who gets introduced to that thing, starts learning how to do it, gets familiar with it, practices it, and then meets standard. And so that's, that's a, a, I guess I'd say a lame attempt at a timeline, but along that timeline, we're going to have to be making formative assessments to see where the child is at. And so, you know, we can um, connect, I'd say formative assessment connects well with um, Donald Shun's idea about teachers being reflective practitioners. And I think it also connects really well with Lev Vygotsky's ideas of zones of proximal development. And the way that I put this to my undergrads is, um, if you believe in the zone of proximal development, how do you determine where that zone is? And I don't know how you determine it without doing formative assessment. If, if anyone knows how to do that, let me know, please. And, because I'll have to change the slide. Right. And the what of teaching, of course, could be strategy skill in the Common Core, could be content domain knowledge, and it could also be related to task knowledge. Right. So lots and lots of things. Right. These are questions that, um, that I ask my doctoral students, my master's students, and my undergraduate students, because they, I, they, they just love the zone of proximal development. I think they go to cocktail parties and they talk about it, you know, to impress their neighbors and stuff. I, but um, I, I do think it's a zone that um, turns out being a zone of formative assessment also. Right, right now I, I want to um, talk about a couple of other things here. And it, this goes back to my, my first teaching job was up in the Adirondack Mountains. I was a um, Title I or Chapter I, whatever it was called back in 1980. And I was a K through six remedial reading teacher. And I had a, my classroom was in the boiler room of uh, what was called Dollsville Central School. And it was a great room to be in late fall, winter, and early spring, but it was really toasty um, in late spring and, and early fall. But um, when I think back to those students, and then I think back to other kids that I've taught um, in junior high school and high school, I don't really think about kids in terms of how their percentile rankings went up on tests. What I think about are the kids who went from non-readers to I'm sometimes willing to consider being a reader, those kinds of kids. And some kids who actually grew in enthusiasm, and I, for which I'd be willing to take maybe 5% credit or something like that. Um, but that's the part that I think is missing in the Common Core. The, the, the best I can figure is that um, in the Common Core, kids get so enthused because they're so engaged with su such wonderful texts and they're doing such wonder wonderful tasks that they can't help but be motivated. And that will power them through all of these challenges and difficulties that they encounter. And I'm guessing that this holds true for all those kids who can't even hit basic because otherwise I don't know how those kids get through to the standards. And the, and the fact that we're not really paying attention to um, things like motivation and engagement on a wholesale level is, is frightening to me because that's where I think we're really building a research corpus that informs, um, well, that says it's important enough to pay attention to and this is how we might start paying attention to it, right? right. So you might know Keith Stanovich's work back from 1986, uh, The Matthew Effect. And in, in this wonderful, wonderful article, it was in Re Reading Research Quarterly, um, Keith looked at studies to try to um, come up with an explanation of why early success for early elementary school readers tended to beget success. And you sort of get a kid as a snowball rolling down a hill, getting faster, bigger, more powerful as a reader. And what, what he found was um, early reading success 
lets kids, um, you know, they're breaking the code, they're getting new vocabulary words, the new vocabulary words give them new knowledge. That builds onto more access to more and more texts, which you'd expect. But I think the, the, the other story about the Matthew effect is that children are human beings, and when they experience success, they go back to it, like most of us do. It makes us happy, it, it makes us feel good about ourselves. In the same time, um, at the same time, kids who experience failure don't want to go back to it. As, as adults, we have option to opt out of things that we're not successful at, except like waiting in line at the Department of Motor Vehicles, but don't get me started on that, right? So um, these are things that we also have to pay attention to, and, and we need to think about how assessment may figure and how we boost kids' self-efficacy in, a, in a, real, um, a real way, not a, not a fake sort of shoring up false self-esteem. How about their agency and volition? How about the attributions that they make for success and failure? Right? Right. And so when, when we think about students and assessment, we, we need to think about, do we, do we think about our students as skill and strategy users? All right? If we do, then our formative assessment may be targeted on those things, and our instruction related to formative assessment may, may give kids more skill and strategy instruction as needed. If we think of them as content area knowledge builders, which we have to with the Common Core, then we may be thinking about how do we help prime their prior knowledge. Uh, and to David Coleman, not too much time spent on that, but you know, how do we get kids walking into a lesson knowing that they'll be able to connect it to something already in their heads? But if we also think about motivated and engaged readers with high self-efficacy, excuse me, I think we should be looking for that. And it, it, it might be in the form of assessment, and it might be just the way that we observe and the way that we listen in our classrooms. Right? Um, okay, so conclusions. Just, just about formative assessment and, and two things that I haven't mentioned. One is, I think we really have to focus on helping kids learn how to do self-assessment, how to become more metacognitive. And to me, the way that we do that is that we share our formative assessment strategies, our evaluation and assessment processes. We uncover them, and as their strategies, they may be amenable to thinking aloud, to uh, modeling and explanation. So that when children start getting questions like, you know these early comprehension monitoring questions like, does that make sense? How do you know? Is there a problem? Where's the problem? Can you fix the problem? Can you get back on track? We need to make sure that kids get that early on in their school careers. So as they move into more complex texts and tasks, they're up to, up to the, the charge of paying attention to everything. The, the last thing would be, um, if you know Peter Johnston's work, he's got two books out in the last five years that are wonderful. He really focuses on teacher language and how it turns kids towards learning or away from learning. And so when, we, when we're dealing especially with our most struggling readers, we have to interact with them with assessment information. And I, and I would say almost as a conclusion that the, the more careful and thoughtful we are in, in how we share assessment information with our most struggling learners is going to make a difference in whether or not they turn away from reading or hang with us and end up giving more effort. Right. All right, so uh, these are everyone's favorite slides, the conclusion slides, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I think basically we really need to pay attention to how formative assessment dovetails with, um, how formative and summative assessment dovetail with one another. And that's really a lot easier to say than it is to do. Um, an assessment has to in form of student learning and progress, not just an increasingly complex text, but increasingly complex tasks, and the two combined.